Hello folks and welcome to the channel and in this video I'm going to try to answer some of your questions related to buying an old timer or an old car or any old machine because I've got questions from you asking how do you do it how do you buy these things so cheap and I'm not lying I am buying these things cheap and I'm going to show you on how I do this I have my way of doing it and it has almost always worked so I'm going to share it with you and today we go in actually to pick up something really special. And almost everybody who has an old piece of metal believes it's worth gold. And that is certainly not the case. Every day I Google these secondhand car sites or other sites where they sell machinery. And I'm looking for things that I like. I have no preset mind of what I want to see, but I'm just browsing through it and if I see something which I like, which pulls my attention, and the price is right, then I'm gonna go for it and I'll contact this guy as soon as I can. Now, pick up the phone and call him as fast as you can. Because that's the way you're gonna assure that whatever you have actually seen is gonna stay available to you and the seller will know that you really want to get it. So make that appointment as soon as you can. Now, I'm not typically not buying from um, businesses because they tend to be a bit too expensive. I rather buy from an individual or private person because sometimes they need money, they want to get rid of something, they need to have space or they have bought a house and they need to sell their hobby stuff. So often these people are in need of money. So these are the right candidates to buy the things from. But of course, you shouldn't go out and contact the guy, visit the site, pick up the stuff just blindly. You have to get prepared. Get yourself informed. Look through manuals, go to websites, clubs and find the weak spots of that specific vehicle or car that you want to buy. Making sure that you have spares available because spares availability can become a major issue. Some cars or old timers are very cheap on the internet because there are just no spare parts for them. So you will have to build all this yourself. Like in the case with old Rusty, uh, this has taken me a long time and a lot of effort just because there are no spare parts. So be aware of that. Also, verify in the manuals or online what are the serial numbers. What do the serial numbers of the engine block, the transmission case, and the chassis you reflect. Do they match? Do they not match? And that might be of importance to you to make sure that the engine that's in it is still the original engine that went with the car. And at last but not at least, judge yourself. What is your skill set? What can you do and what can you not do? Because you may have to outsource certain jobs to get the car in a good working condition and that can cost you a lot of money unless you can do it yourself. Do you have the tools for it? So you always need to make a pretty good assessment. And once you've done that, get in the car, hook up the trailer and visit the person in question. Take cash money with you. That always works. And if you throw that on the table, people will know that you're serious. And if they see money, they are so much faster to give in. Once you're there, show that you are interested, but not too enthusiastic. So let him show you the car. Let him show you exactly what he has. Don't say a lot. Just observe. And then you start your inspection. Look at all the points you wanted to look at. And don't say much. Uh, don't be enthusiastic at all. Um, be interested, but not enthusiastic. Don't say things like, oh, this is great. This is lovely. Well done. This looks real good. Not good, don't say these things. It's much better to say like, hmm, hmm. Don't worry to scratch your cheek every so often. Yeah, hmm, you know. Give him the impression that, yes, there's something wrong with the car, but I'm still interested in it, but I'm not overexcited about it. Because if you show overexcitement or enthusiasm, then he knows he can ask more money and he's going to try to get it from you. If you're a bit more negative or neutral, you know, scratching your cheek and hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, then 
yeah then you have a better chance of getting it cheaper now ask them a couple of questions as well ask them about things that you've seen that are wrong and or not right and you ask them did you change the brake pipes for instance and if you know he didn't then let him explain it and he's going to probably tell you some bullshit story or maybe he's very honest and tells you exactly that he didn't then you go like hmm yeah hmm, that's a bit of work to do that uh, you know things like that once you have done all the inspections on the car and that you have judged for yourself that the car is worth the money which is listed then ask the person if the car comes with spare parts and if it's included in the price and try to get all the spare parts that he has and tell him look if you sell the car you might as well give me the spare parts with it check the paperwork making sure that the car is either imported or still has to be imported if that is the case make sure that it has a title because not having paperwork or the right paperwork may cost you money you may have to import pay import tax and you may have to go and buy a title a certificate of conformity you know all these things can cost you some money so ask for that and judge it and at the end uh, you tell the guy look um, I'm willing to buy this car for so much money which is typically going to be in my case 20 to 25 percent off his asking price and i'm just throwing the money on the table and if you throw the money on the table in front of him and you tell him look here is 80 percent of the sales price i'm going to take the car right now with me and you have the cash money we sign the paperwork and we are done and that always works and make sure that you have sales forms or agreement forms with you in advance that always is very easy because you want to have some kind of an agreement that the car that you're buying is free of any debts because some people do loan money for their old timers and then they sell them because they need money and if you buy an old timer like that with a loan on you don't know about it you could be in deep trouble because you don't own the car the bank owns the car and they can come and get it from you happened once to me but I, finally I got it sorted out anyhow this is how I do it so now it's time for me to hook up my trailer and pick up something real nice. So folks, uh, we are on our way to pick up something really special and what we're going to pick up is something that I haven't picked up before. Typically I'm ending up with some sports cars or something like a rally car but this time I'm going to pick up what we call a really old timer, a pre-war vehicle. Uh, I'm going to pick it up in Waterloo and for those of you who do not know what Waterloo is, Waterloo is a battlefield where Napoleon lost against Wellington. And what I found on the internet was a Peugeot 190S, which is a very small old car built in 1929 and uh, about 30,000 of them were built. It's a steel chassis with a wooden construct on it and it has only a 600 and I think 62 cc or cubic uh, centimeters of cylinder displacement so that's very small and it's a five horsepower uh, engine so uh, we're going to pick that up today and once we are back I'm going to show it to you in a bit more depth what we will have to do on it so I'll see you in a few hours so we are halfway the road and I had to stop for a little pit stop But for the rest everything went uh, very well so as soon as my sandwiches are finished um, we'll continue home we'll drop it off and then return the trailer bon appétit
I just offloaded the Peugeot and this is a 190S. Uh, it's the torpedo model. They were building them from 1928 until 1931 and about 33,000 have been built. Now this model here is what we call the utility vehicle. It's been built in 1929 and I have all the paperwork for it. And as I said, it comes with some basic paperwork, not a lot, but at least it's better than nothing and it's enough to get it on the road. It's powered by a four-cylinder engine, 693 cubic centimeters. So that's a very small engine and it develops about 14 horsepower. So not a hell of a lot. It has three gears forward and one gear backwards. And the funny part about this car is that there is no door on this side. So the driver has no door. There's only one door, which is on the passenger side. And there is a reason for that. And in those days, nobody thought it was necessary to have a door on the driver's side because the driver had to be behind the steering wheel and another one had to start the engine with a crank. This is a bit cranking and there is still compression on it. So that's quite good. So the passenger, they had to get out and crank up the engine. And here it is, a huge power source, 14 horsepower. It's uh, amazing, isn't it? What you see on the bottom here is a magneto. This is the one that is going to generate a high voltage and it's been driven by a chain inside this housing here. If you need to fill up the engine, that's where you do it. The dipstick is over here, very cute. So uh, modern cars have a ignition coil, but in the old days we have what we call a magneto and that's what this part is. Now, if this is faulty, then I'm gonna replace it with a standard ignition coil. But all right, so far, this is looking quite all right. Now over here, we have a dynamo. So this is gonna charge up the system. I haven't found actually the battery yet. I don't think it's on the car so far because it's missing all the electrical cabling. And so that's something we will install um, or have to install because the previous owner started to restore this vehicle, but never completed it. You can actually see the steel beams here. So this chassis is a steel ladder frame and then they have some wood and steel panels on top of that. All right, so let's have a look from the other side. Here we got the spark plugs for the four cylinders, very small, and then we have a Zenith carburetor. And that's about all there is to this uh, engine, really. Uh, the gas tank is over here. And what I really like about these old engines is that, and old cars in general, is that they are so simple, and yet they have so much detail sometimes. For instance, on the radiator, look at that, how nice that is. It tells you where it's built and who built Kind of detailing that we don't see nowadays anymore on modern cars. And that's what I like so much about the very old cars. They are so great in their details. And you're probably wondering, where is the gearbox? There is nothing there. And you're right, what you see is actually the starter wheel. There is no gearbox on the engine itself. The gearbox is all the way in the back. In the back, that's where you have the gearbox. And you're probably wondering what this metal frame structure is. Well, that's where normally the hood is on, but I don't have it. It didn't came with it, but at least the structure is complete. And the good thing is you can actually fold this backwards and have a convertible. Now, isn't that nice? Uh, I gotta see how we fold this because it's a bit, tough because the guy actually painted it but this is how you would fold it down and now you're driving with a convertible what I'm missing actually is the front uh, windscreen that is something I still have to get uh, that was not with the car that's the only missing part but remember that I said that this is a 190s and it's actually a utility vehicle well let me show you why I'm saying that in the back you have a hatch you can open that up and now you can load all the stuff inside because this is only a two-seater, right? So it was a very, very light truck. I'm not sure who would use it, probably the farmers to go to the markets or something like that, but that's what it is. 
Now the steering wheel is intact and the dashboard is intact, even the light inside because they didn't have bulbs in their meters at the time, there was just a dash light. I have actually the big contact lock here, but that's the side in a box, so I still need to mount this. So old cars are quite different than what we are used to today. So right here we've got our gear shifter and we have gear in reverse, we have neutral, then first, second and third forward and this is actually the manual brake but look on the paddles the paddles are interesting the left paddle is the clutch the middle one is the throttle and the right hand one is the brakes so that is quite different than in a normal car isn't it the tires, the brakes, the wheel, the rims all of it is in a fairly good condition in fact it's been restored by the previous owner there is a bit of surface rust on the fenders but the bonnet is in a very good condition and most of the other parts on the car on the bodywork are already been completed there's a lot of good details on this car look on this plaque here from Peugeot and then next to it you will find actually a plaque that tells you how much weight can be loaded on this car so 250 kilograms and its real dead weight is 550 kilograms and then next to that even more interesting where it's been sold Grand Garage so the big garage in Cahors in France. Telephone number 45. Isn't that something? Now in terms of suspension there isn't a lot of suspension on this vehicle. There is only a lateral leaf spring and that's about it. No shock absorbers. So the previous owner has actually started rebuilding already parts of the suspension system and the brakes so that's all been finished and you can actually see that. And what I find always so amazing on these old cars is the details. Look at these copper little things here. They have little stars in it. There's a text on it. I can't really read what it says, but it's really a lot of attention on this car. And you don't see that anymore today on the modern cars. We started to talk in this video about finding a good deal, finding a good bargain. And actually we did, and this is my bargain. Uh, you probably now wonder, well, how much did Steve pay for this? And why is this a good bargain? Well, I'm, first of all, I'm gonna tell you something. Um, I bought this for 4,000 euros, and this is exactly what I paid for it. And that is good, good, good money. I mean, that is really a lot of car for a little bit of money. Um, and of course, a little bit of money is all relative, but for this car in this condition, that is good money. Now the owner, that had this car before had started to restore it but then he bought a house and he is now renovating his house he's rebuilding the house and he needs a lot of money and he needs all the time so he needs to get rid of the vehicles and he had a couple of them he is about two or three of them so he needed to get rid of them so as soon as possible because he needed the space as well and that's why this was so easy to buy it for this price. I knocked off this a specific car 1,500 euros because he was asking uh, 5,600 or close to 6,000 euros so I was able to bring that down quite a bit to 4,000. So that is first of all why this is a good deal. The second thing is the car has papers. The car is original and it has all the parts. It's already partially restored, not completely. There's still some body work to be done. I still have to install all the electrical cabling. But hey, that is minor work. I don't mind doing this. The only part that I'm missing is the windscreen. This is something I will have to construct myself or try to find one on an old market somewhere because they are hard to find and you can't find them new anymore or aftermarket parts. That's a bit the problem with these kind of cars. You don't find too many parts of it. Anyhow, so I thought, yeah, not, not a bad deal. He actually uh, rebuilt already the bodywork completely. He did redo all the wood because I forgot to mention this. This is actually a steel frame in combination with wood and then they put panels on top of the wood. So um, yeah, I, I'm quite happy with this uh, procurement. So you'll see more videos on this vehicle. We still have to give it a name. So give me a hint guys, what do you want to call it? Folks, we've come to the end of this video and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And all I can say to you now is au revoir mes amis et à bientôt.